Yeah. Would you grab the door for me? Don't lock it, just pull it to. I'm a bit scared the information will leak out. I want to go into your head instead. So last lecture we uh, talked a bit about what this, this course would be composed of and I set out our aims and objectives and then I quickly went over some, some circuit terminology with which I reckon most of you are probably already familiar, if not you are now. And then we did a bit about units which, which really is <coughs> bordering on obvious. And then I went into passive components and we talked about inductors, capacitors and, and resistors. And I had someone show them around, it was all a bit primary schoolish. And uh, then we go to some equations for their, their time domain relationship between the voltage and the current. So in this lecture I will be talking about the other circuit components that are neither passive nor active because they don't really exist. They're passive, I suppose, in the sense that they always do the same thing, but you can't buy these. So they're voltage and current sources. And we'll talk about perfect ones and imperfect ones and how it relates to some of the things you'll have seen in 117. Or you will be seeing in 117. <coughs> and then I want to do some circuit theorems. Every loves a good theorem makes you feel warm in your belly. And then we'll end up with some, uh, some first order networks, uh, filters and time domain, that sort of thing. And that will be broadly familiar if you've done the AC circuits lab. But the chances are if you've done the AC circuits lab, you still don't understand it, which is perfectly normal. So it may or may not make things better or worse, depends. And then of course there'll be a fair. So an ideal voltage source is two terminal circuit elements supplying a fixed voltage <coughs> having zero internal resistance. Well, this is quite unusual because it implies that it can supply infinite current if you were to short it. If I've got a, a battery and I've put a bit of wire across it and it's quite a chunky battery, like you find in a car, um, but the wire will melt. Somebody who works in my lab did this the other day and there was a lot of shouting and opening the window because the wire outside melts and <coughs> smokes and that sets the fire alarm and <coughs> empties the building and that makes everybody sad because we get the blame. And we're usually to blame, to be fair, but I don't like it to happen. So the first thing you do is switch it off and run over the window. Um, a car battery is a pretty good approximation to an ideal battery because it really will supply an enormous current should you connect its terminals together with, say, a screwdriver. Interestingly, if you were to drop the screwdriver onto the terminals, the force that is imparted to it by the current that suddenly flows through it makes it bounce. So if you do drop it, don't look over it because it'll be kind of chip. But if you had a, a 9 volt PP3 like you might put in a remote control car or something, if you short it out, the wire will get hot and the battery will get hot and then you throw the battery away and that will be the beginning and end. Nothing Alright, okay, I'll qualify that. Probably nothing bad will happen. I have seen somebody do it and then put the battery in a plastic bin and he melted a hole in the bottom of the bin. So, a real voltage source will not be able to supply this infinite current, but an ideal one will. And the thing that makes them non-ideal is that we insert a little resistor in series with the voltage source to drop some voltage depending on how much current flows. So the more current that flows in that internal resistance, the less voltage will be available on the terminals of our composite battery, which is the voltage source and its internal resistance. Similar arguments apply for currents. We can say that I could, I could have some circuit element that doesn't really exist. There's some notes knocking about somewhere. Um, and that uh, I can dial in any current I want. And <coughs> Whatever goes on inside that circuit element will force the right voltage across its terminals to make that current flow. Of course, if those terminals are open, no connection at all, 
then that voltage is going to get really big very, very quickly. And in some sort of semi-real scenario, if I had such a thing and it was on the desk, the air would break down between the terminals and the voltage would become enormous to make that happen. But such things don't exist. All current sources have limits. And we can apply the same idea of an internal resistance to a current source as well. And it just so happens that the internal resistance is in parallel with the current source. Whereas in the, uh, in the voltage source case, it's in series. And we will call these two things, the, uh, the voltage source will be a Thevenin source, and the current source will be a Northern source. So what about this internal resistance? If I had a voltage source in a box with two terminals, and somebody had written voltage source on top, and they said, find the internal resistance, what would be the approach? Well, we could start by taking our voltage source and connecting it to a current source. And we could say, all right, well, I know what the voltage is on the voltage source because I, I can measure it with a multimeter. And then I can take my current source and dial in any current I like. So I could plot a graph changing the current source's value by a little bit for each data point. Isn't this the first lecture of the day? Well, up to at night. No, don't, don't answer, it's alright. Um, so, we'll go, in the example in the slide, we'll go between 0 and, and 6 amps. And I've, <coughs> I've said this is, this is going to be a 12 volt voltage source. Yeah, there's loads of seats down here. Um, so, in, in that graph, we're, what we're saying is that the blue line is what happens to the voltage across the terminals of the battery when we adjust the current. So, as I move from zero on the y-axis up to the six, I would be possibly expecting the blue line to deviate, and it would be y equals mx plus c, or y equals minus mx plus c, or whatever, or minus c. In fact, because there is no internal resistance at all, the line is straight. However much current we draw out, or put in, there will be no deviation in the voltage. Does that concern anybody? Please say now, if not, or if it does. Otherwise, write it on the end of the paper. So what we're really saying is the, the gradient of the blue line cannot be found because there is no change in the voltage. So we're doing a change in current, which is 0 to 6, for example, and there is no change in voltage to go with it, so we're dividing through by 0. Sorry, we're dividing through by... I'd have to check the last line on this slide. We shall see. So in the case of the current source, we'll do the same thing, but we'll do it the other way around. We've now got a fixed current source that I don't know about. So perhaps in some job interview some years from now, for some company or another, they'll produce a little black box and go, there's some terminals on the front, here's a meter, what, what's in the box? In which case you can panic. Now don't panic. You have to use your skills of deduction, which is what laboratories are supposed to develop. And this is a sort of a deductive task as well. <coughs> it's the same as the last one, but backwards. We will, that happened to me once, by the way, so they do it. The other thing they like to do is they'll go, we've got a small circuit diagram for you, and they'll produce a piece of paper out of this wire, and they'll do that with it, and it'll just go and go and go. Yeah, yeah what is it? Oh. Still, that's actually slightly worse than this. Yeah, you know, that water droplet sound. I could kill Android. They're nearly as bad as Nokia with um, the SMS tone from years ago. I still hear that sometimes. I think of it fondly. So maybe in 10 years' time I'll think of that one fondly as well. But I doubt it. Um, even worse than that is the one that wakes me up in the morning. 
if I hear that and I'm not about to be woken up by it, it's very frustrating because it makes me feel like I've got to get out of bed. I don't want it. Anyway, <coughs> going briefly back to electronics, we will adjust the voltage source and see what happens to the current. Is there any change in current as we, as we put more voltage on or on this source? And there won't be because there is no internal resistance. So however much I change up or down the voltage, the current will always be fixed at 3 amps. So we'll have the, we're running into the same problem where we've got a change in V this time, whereas previously we had no change in V, and now we have no change in I, whereas previously we had a measurable change in I. So we end up in a situation where we say, well, the slope of this line, sorry, the gradient of this line, bleh, the internal resistance is infinite. I suspect if you plot those graphs, if you look at those graphs, the axes are such that we've got one over the quantity, which is why it looks backwards on the bottom line. So we've got to do some theorems, and if you look in a textbook, you'll probably see something a bit like this, perhaps slightly longer. I, I cut this down a bit. <coughs> this is Thevenin's theorem. Any network of resistance <coughs> elements and energy sources, so resistance elements we described last lecture, energy sources we've just whipped through, can be replaced by a series combination of an ideal voltage source and a resistance, brackets in series, where VT is the open circuit voltage of the network, <coughs> And RT is the ratio of the open circuit voltage to the short circuit current. So we'll have to do two tests to get the Thevenin equivalent circuit. And the method is as follows. So this is for a, a potential divider, which is two resistors that share some voltage. First thing you've got to do is find out what the, the Thevenin voltage is going to be. So by measurement or calculation, that's another way of saying you might have to do it with the multimeter, but it could come, in, could come up in an exam. Get the voltage across the nodes of interest without anything connected. So in, in the figure on the, the left, can you actually see the bottom of it? Can you see the bottom of it? Good. Right, there. So we'll measure VO with nothing <coughs> else added in. So everything that's there, but nothing else, except the meter, obviously. But we'll assume the meter's perfect, it just gives you a number. And once we've got that, we'll write it down in our lab book. Not a piece of paper we brought instead. And then, by measurement or calculation, we'll find the current that flows when we've got a thick bit of wire and put it across the O. So we'll short out R2 and find out what current flows through the short. And this will give us the short circuit current. So we've got the Thevenin voltage, measured it in the beginning, it's the voltage where there's nothing connected. And we've got the current that flows when we short out the point that we're measuring across. And if we divide the first by the second, we'll get a resistance value, because we'll do volts upon ohms. That small gap is where I do ohms law in my head, every time, forever and ever. Ohm may well be the most well-used word on the planet. Isn't he a lucky chap? Not that he knows anything about it. When you think of all the engineers in all the world, they must say at home 100 times a day each. Consider how many times it's said. It's fascinating. Ish. Or at the very least, it's surprising when you think about it. So we'll divide VT by, we'll divide the Thevenin voltage by the short circuit current to get a value for the Thevenin resistance RT. So on the right there, yeah, it's on the right. If I shorted out R2, I ought to measure VI. No, I wouldn't. I'd measure nothing if I shorted out R2. No voltage if you short out R2. And if I had the open circuit voltage, then it would be VI potentially divided by R1 and R2, which would be VI times R2 over R1 plus R2. And the current that flows ought to be VI divided by R1, because R2 has nothing to do with it because we shorted it out. 
there will be one or two tutorial ah, problem sheet questions that involve it. So similarly for Norton, there is a theorem, any network or resist of resistance elements and energy sources can be replaced by a parallel combination of ideal current source IT and an internal resistance RT, where IT is the short circuit current of the circuit, and RT is the ratio of the open circuit voltage to the short circuit current. So actually we'll do the same tests, and we can do them in the same order as well, but the end calculation is slightly different. So in this case, by measurement or calculation, you find IN. So you first short out R2, because that's where VO is. And you measure the current that flows, which is I, in the diagram on the left. And then you say, well, I'll take away my short circuit, and I'll measure what VO is. And it will be the potential division of VI by R1 and R2. And then I'll put those numbers into my Norton circuit. And then I've done it, that'll be it. <coughs> so if you look closely, RT is the same. It's not always the same. Or maybe it is always the same. Who can say? If you're really feeling keen, you can prove it one way or the other. But I'll leave that to your own time. So, we could transform these sources between each other. Not only can we reduce any circuit which contains resistors and um, voltage sources and current sources into a voltage source and a resistance, or a resistance and a current source, we can also go from resistance and current source to resistance and voltage source. This, um, that lovely circuit on the, on the left is a real current source. The question of how you get between them, um, you would have done it in 117, or if you haven't, then you will very soon. Um, you won't need it for this particularly, but you will get it along the way somewhere. Something you will need in this course, though, is superposition. I won't be too worried about loop analysis and node analysis and all that. You, you will be, but I won't be. Um, the only thing that you will need for this is superposition. If you can master that, you're safe, as far as I'm concerned. So, if a circuit consists of linear components, that's to say everything we've discussed so far, resistors, capacitors, inductors, uh, voltage sources and current sources, then the combined effect of several energy sources on a circuit, so I've got more than one voltage source, more than one current source, or one of each, or any other selection you can choose. <coughs> The result of each source on the circuit, so the voltages and currents that flow in the circuit because of each source, can be considered independently, and then you add them up afterwards. Sounds easy. When I say add them, the algebra will take care of whether you're adding or subtracting, but broadly speaking, you add them, and if there's minus signs, that means you'll be taking away. So, how do we know what to do with our voltage and current source? Because what I'm saying is, I've got a circuit and you can worry about one bit at a time, or one source at a time. How do you know what to do with all the other sources? Do you switch them off, unplug them, short circuit them? It depends. And it depends on their internal resistance, which is why we have to have all the stuff about third and north to start with. If I was to switch off a current source, I'd still be left with its internal resistance. And if it was a perfect current source, that internal resistance would be infinite, which is the same as saying it's an open circuit. So if I was to replace, now I'll take out the current, or not take out, but switch off the current source, and it was a perfect current source, I'd be left with just its infinite internal resistance, open circuit. If it was not a perfect current source, I'd be left with whatever its internal resistance was. Similar arguments apply to the voltage source. If I had a voltage source that I needed to switch off and it was perfect, I'd have to short circuit its terminals. If it had an internal resistance, the internal resistance would be all that would be left because the voltage source would be shorted out.
So, here's a quick example. If you want to see some full working for this, um, I'm not sure this example is actually in the book. I think I made this one up. because I couldn't find one that I thought was sufficiently simple. But if you want lots of superposition practice, Smith and Dorf, uh, which was orange in the fifth edition with a white bit on the front and a picture of a semiconductor, is a really good book. And there's several copies in the library, if you can't find one cheaply. So find the contribution of each source to the current flowing in R2. So this is a standard sort of problem sheet type question, one of the earlier ones that are a bit easier. So with both sources in the far left diagram, you don't really know what's going to happen. You could, if you wished, use loop or node analysis and not worry about the superposition. You will, assuming you make no algebraic errors or write, don't write your loops out properly or anything, assuming you don't make any mistakes, you'll get the same answer for all three methods, for superposition, for loop and for node. But if we were going to do it by superposition, we could choose which source we want to switch off first. And I've started on the left, so I'm going to switch off the current source and leave the voltage source switched on. And the circuit reduces to, uh, to a potential divider, which is nice and easy because the equation for that is well known and we can say, well, if I want to know the current R2, it's just V1 divided by the sum of R1 and R2. Every happy with that. Good. So then I'll switch off V1 and leave myself with I1. And now I've got two resistors in parallel with the current source. And this is a current sharing circuit. The current will flow in proportion to the relative size of the resistances and the smaller resistor will get the bigger current. So it's the other way up from how voltages get shared because bigger, bigger resistances get bigger voltages, bigger resistances get smaller currents. So that will be I1 times R1 plus R2. And if we worry about the direction of I2, IR2, sorry, in both cases IR2 flows down the page uh, the way I've drawn it. I haven't decided that, I worked it out. And the way it's worked out is you have to say, well, which way will I1 cause a current to flow? Well, there's an enormous arrow next to it, so that's self-evident. Which way will the voltage source cause the current to flow? Well, the, the current's going to leave the more positive terminal and return to the more negative terminal. So you cannot uh, ascribe the direction of the current. You actually have to think about it. So you'll add up these two equations, the, the equation for I R2 due to V1 and the equation for I R2 due to I2. And when I say add them, if it had turned out that the current source was the other way around, you would be subtracting them because I R2 in the rightmost diagram would have been flowing the other direction and the arrow would be the other way around as well. So you switch off each source, consider them in turn, sum up the results. What then about power transfer? Consider. I love questions that start with consider. And I love second parts that start hence or otherwise. Because it really scares the life out of people when they read them. <clears throat> Not of course that that's my objective. No. Consider an imperfect voltage source. So that's to say one which has an internal resistance. which is not zero. Is there an optimum resistance to transfer the maximum power from the source into the circuit? So what I'm really saying is, if I've got the freedom to adjust RL, is there a value of RL which will let me get the most power <coughs> out of the source that I can? Quick show of hands, who thinks there is? Who thinks there is not? <laughs> who is uncommitted? And who doesn't care? Liars. <laughs> <coughs> so 
So everyone else must be asleep. Um, we can do it by two methods. We can put some numbers in, and if we choose our numbers carefully, we'll be able to deduce something, something to do with our answer. That is a fairly sized yawn, sir. <laughs> Are you okay? Do you need a biscuit? No? Sure? It is quite warm in here. So we can put in some numbers and see what happens. Or we can do a bit of maths and, and come to a, an exact answer. And we'll have a go at both. So let's have a look at the, uh, the trial and error. If I said, well, I've got 12 volts and 5 milliohms internal resistance. Now, this is about right <coughs> for uh, an SLI battery in a car, start a light ignition. So, it's the battery which formerly you would change in a car, but now they seem to be covering them in plastic and stopping you even doing that for some reason. Um, that battery. So, this is a standard petrol car or diesel car. It's no funny electric car business, it's just the regular battery. Um, about 5 milliohms internal resistance. So you can work out roughly what the short circuit current will be from that, if you wish. It's big. Um, so I can choose RL. So I'm going to choose RL to be somewhat <coughs> smaller than 5 milliohms. And then I'll make it exactly 5 milliohms. And then we'll make it somewhat bigger and see what happens. And the, the cases are, are drawn out there. <coughs> so we've got 12 times 2.5 over 2.5 plus 5 gives us 4 volts, and using V squared upon R, that will yield 6.4 kilowatts in RL. Anybody want to hear how I do this more slowly? Are you happy with it? <coughs> and then I'll decide on 5 milliohms, and of course I'm, I'm choosing these in the full knowledge of what's going to happen. If this was some real situation where you were stuck on something, you'd be guessing at what values to choose and it wouldn't necessarily go this well or end this swiftly. <coughs> but we have then 12 times 5 over 5 plus 5 is 6 volts, which is 7.2 kilowatts. And the last one yields 6.9. And if you did this a lot of times and then plotted a graph, you'd get the graph which is on the uh, right. So there is a maximum. And it looks very much like the maximum is when RL and RT are equal to each other. But we can do a bit better than this. If we wanted to know if there was a maximum, we'd be looking for the turning point. Now, we know there's a turning point, because I just showed you the graph, and there's a turning point. You can see that it sort of does that, and the turning point's on the top. But let's assume that we didn't draw the graph, we still want to know about the turning point, so we'll say what is VRL given our power expression? So this is the power in the load resistor is the load resistor voltage squared divided by the load resistance. And we can say that also <coughs> the load resistor voltage is the potential division of the thermal voltage by RL and RT. And if we substitute um, VRL into PRL, so that's the, the right hand one into the left hand one, we'll end up with the, the, the second line down. That's just a straight substitution. And then we'll differentiate that with respect to RL because we're interested in finding the turning point based on the value of RL being our parameter. And we'll end up with that horrible equation which is near the bottom. If you spend 10 minutes working it through, it all reduces to RL is equal to RT. If you don't believe me, give it a go. It's one of these situations where I say, I'm going to skip a few lines now, and about 20 lines of working later out pops the answer. But this is not examinable. <clears throat> it's just something that you ought to know. I want to move on to something else now. This is the question of what happens with capacitors and resistors and voltage sources. And it doesn't really fit anywhere else in this course, so I'll put it right in the beginning so you can have it forever early on. I've got this RC circuit, so it's a resistor 
and a capacitor in series with a voltage source, or it's a thevenin source with a capacitor connected across it. It's up to you, same thing. And we know from the last lecture that the differential relationship for the current in the capacitor, or the current flowing through the capacitor, is C dV by dt, where, where V is the voltage across the capacitor. And it just so happens that the, there is an exponential relationship for this circuit. And we'll go through briefly how I come to that in a few slides' time. But looking at the graph for a moment, the red line is the current, the green line is the capacitor voltage, and the blue line is the input voltage. So I have chosen to put a square pulse into this circuit, and I'm worried about the result of that square pulse. Would anyone care to hazard an educated guess as to why any of those lines look the way they do? Except the blue one, because I've just told you. Definitely biscuits involved. Not worth a biscuit, it must be a seriously difficult problem. Right. <clears throat> When the pulse enters the circuit, there is no charge in the capacitor. We've decided that the capacitor has been discharged for a very long time. And if I wanted to change the capacitor's voltage, I'd have to put some charge in. And I can't put any charge in in an infinitely small period of time, because that would require an infinitely large current to flow, and I haven't got one of those to hand. So the capacitor voltage cannot change quickly, or it cannot change infinitely quickly. So as soon as the pulse enters the circuit, the, the, uh, the node which connects R and C to the up and rightmost node must be at the same potential as the lower rightmost node, or the reference node at the bottom. And it can't <coughs> move without some current flowing. So, that means that as soon as the pulse hits the, uh, the circuit, <coughs> the capacitor is essentially a short circuit. And the current that flows is completely described by the, resistor, uh, the voltage source divided by the resistance. And the reason for this is the capacitor can't change its voltage instantaneously. And you can't have an instantane in, uh, infinite current flowing for an infinitely small period of time. You must have some time and some current will develop some change in voltage. That's the differential relationship for the uh, voltage and, in, and current for the capacitor. So the capacitor is discharged. We could stay, if we're really feeling mean, five minutes ago, I put half a coulomb of charge in this capacitor. And then I switched it off, so the voltage source was replaced by its internal resistance. And there was some discharging going on. Work out how much charge was lost. Then I put this pulse in. In which case, it wouldn't be a short, but it would, something would go on, and that, that would be very unfair. This is the simplest possible case where it's been switched off for ages and ages. So, the current that flows at the instant the pulse hits is, is V in upon R, because C is essentially short, and the current that flows in R starts to charge up the capacitance, <coughs> and as it does so, you get a change in voltage. Now, as the capacitor's voltage rises, it makes the voltage across the resistor smaller. Vc is attempting to approach V in, and as it does so, the voltage across the resistor is falling. And the voltage across the resistor is the thing that determines how much current flows into the capacitor. So as the capacitor charges up, it takes away voltage from the resistor, which causes the capacitor to charge more slowly than it was just previously which increases the voltage across the capacitance, which further reduces the voltage across the resistance, which further reduces the current that's flowing, which causes the capacitor to charge more slowly. But it is still charging, and it will make it all the way up to whatever V in is. So that's the, the cause of the green line. That exponential shape is the reduction of the, the resistor's voltage as a result of the capacitor charging up. <coughs> The shape of the current is exactly what I've just described. The bigger the capacitor voltage gets, the smaller the, resistance, the smaller voltage the resistor will have, and the lower the current will be. So it's not surprising if one of these is exponential, the other one must be too.
Coffee used to be there. Much better. Right. Oftentimes, you will see one of these and then the other, especially if you look in a textbook. And oftentimes, they produce different graphs. I've got the same graph, but with different colours. I like it. much better that way because it tells you more about what's going on. If you produce different graphs, it makes people think that it's a different circuit. Well, it is a different circuit, kind of, but it's not really because you can change the order of the components in this circuit and it doesn't change the circuit's operation, but it does change what you get out, allegedly. One is high pass, the other is low pass. Well, that's really troubling because if it's the same circuit and you put the same thing in, the same physical process must happen. Why is it everybody says they're different? Well, actually it's not the circuit's fault, it's the people's fault. Because we're determining what the circuit does by how we measure our output. In the prior case, we were saying that the output that we were interested in was the voltage across the capacitor, which was uh, DC. But in the, in the present circuit, the high pass one, people are always worried about the voltage across the resistor. And that's the key difference. The circuit operation is the same. So if you look at the, uh, when you look at these, when you, you get home, all you'll see the differences between these slides is the circuit diagram has changed, the order of the components changed, and also what the colors on the graph mean has changed as well. Other than that, it's the same thing. I could, if I so desired, put, this circuit diagram on this slide and just relabel the colours again and that would be as valid. It's all to do with how you think about it because it is the same circuit secretly. So in this case, same rules for the capacitor apply. There is no voltage, there is no voltage across the capacitor when there is no charge stored in it and hasn't been for a long time and the capacitor cannot change its voltage instantly. So. In this case, the capacitor voltage is still green, the current is still red, and the input voltage is still blue. And what we're not plotting is VR. And VR is what everybody likes to call the output. So, last chance for a biscuit, what should the shape of VR be? Come on. You know you want it. Yep. Is that a hand, or are you not a hand? I thought you were being brave. Well, now I've got some current which is red, and I've got a resistor which is B is IR, and I want to know what the shape of the, the graph of the voltage across the resistor will be. seems to be a bit upset by the concept of biscuits this year. It's a bit weird. Well, clearly, What will probably happen is, come week sort of week 9, 10, 11, <coughs> when you're all starving to death and run out of money, you'll start turning up just to get fed. Um, so, yeah, the thing that's missing off this is VR, which is the output, and it's just a scaled version of the red graph, the red line, sorry. <coughs> so, in this case, the, uh, the consequence of what, or the, what happens to the capacitor is the same. It's just a case of what you call your output. So, how do we go about figuring out ages ago, back here, I said VC was V in brackets 1, minus E raised to the minus T upon RC. How do you come by that? Well, this isn't examinable in this course. I don't think it could turn up in 117, but it might. The way you go about it is to say, 
that I know that V in must be the sum of EC and VR. The, you just sum up the voltages around the loop, essentially. And you know that there can only be one current because there is only one loop. And that current is uh, VR upon R, which is the current resistor, must also be the current capacitor, must also be the current at the source. And we know that I is CDV by ET for the capacitor. So we've got two expressions of current and one for the voltages. Now, if we combine the current expressions together and solve it for VR, so I'm going to put C dV by dt equals V R. Should that be a big R? Should. Oh dear. VR should be big, sorry. Although I've got it as small on the. Well, I prefer the little r next to v to be big, but anyway, that's by the by. Um, so I've got c dv by t is equal to v r upon r, and then I've solved that to give me v c, and I've I've got an integral in there now because previously I had a differential that I needed to get rid of, and I've managed to take out some factors outside the integral as well. And if I rewrite the loop equation, now the loop equation is v in is equal to v c plus v r. <coughs> If I rewrite the <coughs> equation and insert the, the integral that I've just got, I'll end up with 2. So what's happened there is I've got V in on the left equals insert VC here plus VR. Now, they're all a function of time, so that's where the, the brackets T comes from. And if I was to differentiate both sides of that, to leave me with the change in V in and the change in everything on the, on the right, I'd, I'd essentially be doing three. So I haven't done the differentiation yet, I'm just saying I'm gonna. Now that's quite ugly actually, and we can rewrite it in prime notation. Now, wherever there's a little prime, it just means first differential. And if I had two primes, that would be second differential. So four and, four and three are the same thing, just written differently. And it looks much nicer. So we've got V in prime, so dV in by dt is equal to 1 upon R C V R plus V R prime. So if we set 4 to 0 and solve it for, isolate rather, for V R prime, so we've now got the rate of change of V R with respect to time is equal to minus some factor times whatever V R is right now. So this is a differential equation. If, have you met different differential equations in maths yet? <coughs> yeah. They're not very nice, are they? No. It's all right. A bit later, there'll be this um, little bit of mathematics called Laplace transforms, and they make all those horrible ordinary differential equations go away. And finding the, the general solution and the specific solution and that sort of business, it all just bugs off, and we can do it much easier. Um, but for now, you need to know how that works in order to see, or to, to understand why what comes later works as well. So just soldier on with it for a bit and you'll be all right. Um, so if I've got an equation where I've got differential of something is equal to the thing it is right now, if I need something in my solution that I'm going to be able to differentiate and get the thing it is now, if I was to differentiate an exponential, what I'll end up with is another exponential. And that may prove useful. So I've got the general solution, but now I need the, the other bit. Um, and the good thing about physical problems is the other bit, you can usually work it out by thinking about it as opposed to doing some maths. <coughs> So the steady state term, or the, the specific bit, depends on the type of input signal. So it depends what I did to it in the beginning as to what the specific part is. That's no surprise there. So we used a unit step. And since the capacitor looks like an open circuit to DC signal, that's saying if I've got a constant voltage and I put it onto a capacitor, no current will flow after the capacitor is charged up to whatever that voltage is. It will just sit there, no current faster in the voltage source have the same voltage and that's the state that it would be in forever. So VC tends to V in as time tends to infinity, which means that VR must tend to zero. Well, why is that? 
back up here, uh, there, I said V in is VC plus VI. VC tends to be in, that doesn't leave anything for VI, it gets no share at all. So for the low pass circuit, which is the slightly easier one to think about, VC tends to be in. For the high pass circuit, VR tends to zero. Uh, they, they may end up being the same thing in disguise. So why is the exponential a logical place that I've just pulled this exponential back here out of the clear blue because my analysis stopped before I got to that point. The, the important thing is that I looked it up in a table of differential equations or I asked my computer to solve it for me. Depends on your point of view. If you don't like the sound of this sort of thing, Smith and Dorff is a really good book on the subject. I will give out some notes in the next lecture that go through how this is all derived um, by a slightly different method. And the logic of giving you two methods is that if you really, really can't get along with this one, the other one, which is also mathematically valid, might serve you a bit better. Nevertheless, this is not examined. So if it's making you feel a bit panicky, don't, it's okay. So in this lecture we considered some perfect and imperfect voltage sources, voltage and current sources, and we showed that perfect current sources have infinite parallel resistance, and that voltage sources have, current sources have infinite parallel resistance, and voltage sources have zero series resistance. And we introduced the idea of Thevenin and Norton. And we did all the other stuff on the slide too. <laughs> Have any questions, email me. <laughs> <laughs>